sing the verse one more time. Feel like we need to say this. Don't get satisfied or used to what the Lord is doing. If you think this is all there is, what we have now, this is not it. This is not all of it. Because God is calling us to be radically different for Him. And what that means sometimes is there's going to be a line, as Pastor and Steve begin to say, there's going to be a line drawn. The battle lines are drawn. And we're going to have to make a deeper commitment to the Lord in the coming years because the church is going to rise and the Bible says that she would be without spot and blemish. And we say, Lord, bring your fire and just burn out everything not like you. And Lord, thank you for the revival you sent here. But Lord, send it all across the United States. Every lukewarm Christian, Lord, bring them to a confrontation. Bring them to a place of decision that says, I'm not going to be religious anymore. I'm going to be a believer. I'm going to be a Christian. I'm going to lay down the world and take up the cross and follow Jesus because he's about to return and he's coming after a bride that has made herself ready. Hallelujah. As we lift up your name, as we lift up your name, Lord, let your fire fall.
we say bring the two-edged sword and further divide further divide us from this world further set us apart Lord we want to be holy in your sight we want to be holy in your sight Lord sneaking feeling like one or two things is about to happen and both of them is great. Either, either God is going to perpetuate this revival and it's going to keep going deeper and deeper and higher and higher and longer and longer or either the clouds are about to split and Jesus is about to come. <laughs> Hallelujah! Matter of fact, Let's go ahead and do this now. Get everything broke loose. Get that uh, shofar. Amen. Brother Mike, come on up here and read that scripture again. Read it to our people today. Hallelujah. How many of you believe Jesus is about to come? I want, I want you just to take just a moment and I want you to listen to something, friend. God's given us two of the most remarkable Jewish men in the, mess, in the Messianic... Dick, come here. In the Messianic Jewish world today, God's given us two of the most powerful Messianic Jewish men, evangelists, to be here with us in this revival. And this is God. Listen, friend, everything that's happened here, there wasn't a, there wasn't a, a we didn't sit down and draw out a schematic for this revival. It was all stumbled on. God just sent these men. He sovereignly called them. He's in this place powerfully for some reason. And he sent us these two powerful Jewish men. And I didn't even know Dick could blow the show far. But uh, he can. Matter of fact, he can blow it better than any of the other ones I've heard blow it. And Mike is, a, and of course, Dick is an able teacher of the word, an able preacher of the word. Mike is such a tremendous man of God. But he read this to us Friday night in the 333rd service that we had. And then Dick sounded the shofar. This morning, I just feel in my spirit that we're so close to either God doing, I'm talking about phenomenal, mind-blowing things in this revival, or either his coming is just, it's approaching so quickly now. His coming is so quick. We're coming up now. Before you can turn around good, it'll be Christmas. And then before you can turn around good, it'll be Easter again. Before you can turn around good, it'll be Labor Day again. The years are clicking off. Every week we turn around, there's another week knocked down in revival. The weeks are flying by. And God's sending in the souls, and God's sending in the preachers, and they're being mightily touched. They're going back out across America and the world. And wherever they're going now, they're beginning to preach for souls. They're beginning to fish for men. I believe there's a last day harvest going on right now, friend, that's remarkable. Just before Pastor said what he said, I was standing there on the platform hearing myself say these words to all of you as, as my wife and I are in the process of, of uh, selling our house in Maryland and relocating to be here and as I'll be with you here regularly through the you know from here on God willing and uh, I heard myself saying these words to you that that speaking for my wife and I if this does not get deeper and more radical we'll all be deeply disappointed deeply di listen I, I cry my eyes out here just the same as you do 
each night. I'm, I'm blown away. I get on my face and thank God he's allowing me to be part of it. I tell the brothers all the time, I hug them, I said, thank God he's allowing us to be part of this. That's my heart. But, but listen, we're still scratching the surface in terms of what God's ready to do. We're, listen, if the crowds don't grow all over the place, if the conviction doesn't get heavier, if it doesn't hit the streets, if we don't equip laborers and send them around the world, we've missed it. This is the beginning. And, and when I was asked to read the scripture again, I didn't read from verse 1. I just read verse 3, Jeremiah 33, 3. But I, I was just quickened to go back and read the context, the first couple of verses. Just listen to this. I believe this is prophetic for us. While Jeremiah was still confined in the courtyard of the guard, the word of the Lord came to him a second time. This is what the Lord says, he who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name, just as we sang, this is my father's world. Then verse three, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. And what I believe the Spirit's saying is this is still confined. It's spreading around America. The fire is spreading. Tons of people, hundreds of thousands of people are being touched all over. And God's saying it's still confined and it's about ready to burst. It's about ready to burst. And the Spirit says, call to me. Take this as a personal word from God to you. William Carey said, expect great things from God, the father of modern missions. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Right now, right, understand this, in the last six years, one-third of all church growth in the history of the world has taken place in the last six years. Do you understand that? Do you understand things are happening now every day that have never happened before? 16,000 new churches being planted every week. 78,000 estimated conversions around the world every day. And this is almost all spirit-filled, Holy Ghost, signs and wonders, gospel. It's still confined. We're still at the early stages. It's still getting ready to burst. As Steve has said, what's going to happen when all the physical miracles start taking place? Where are you going to put the people? What's going to happen when it spills out on the courtyards? What's going to happen when it hits the bingo halls and the striptease places? What's going to happen when it hits the bars? What's going to happen when it hits Capitol Hill? wonder he's going to see the face of Jesus he said the next most amazing thing will be that I use the power of prayer so little oh man let's go for it let's go for it every time I see God moving in here it just encourages my heart to believe for the impossible to believe for the impossible let's go for it friends listen let, don't look to what man can do don't look to what man can do look to what God can do so as the shofar blast comes let the cry go up. The cry that's going to go up when we see the Lord return with that very same shofar blast. Let the cry go up. And let God take you up into his glory and bring you into the realm where all things are possible to him who believes. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Before we sound the shofar, I just want to share something for just a moment. The other evening, uh, it was the 333rd service here. Brother Mike read from Jeremiah chapter 33 and verse 3. But the Lord spoke to me about Ezekiel 33, and I believe in, him, in what uh, Brother Lindell said just a moment ago. In Ezekiel 33, verse 3, 
if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people. Then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. There's a great warning going across this nation. I heard this morning there was a sword that was ready to fall. The sword is falling, brother, and it's the sword of the anointing, and it's going to divide from north to south, east and west. And at the sound of the trumpet, we want to begin to shout this morning. We want to break those strongholds because the sword of the Lord and Gideon is going to fall. I walked over to Steve just a moment ago, and I just kept feeling something in my spirit, and I didn't want to say it, but the Spirit of the Lord just keeps speaking to my heart that there's a sword, the sword of the Word of God, the Lord's sword is coming into our midst, and there's going to be a division, and there's going to be a strong division because there's too many people that still have too much junk that they're holding on to, and for God to, to move in this world like He wants to move, the stuff's got to go. And there's a place of decision coming as the sword begins to fall, a place of decision that you decide I'm in or I'm out because this mamby-pamby, pansy Christianity we've known is coming to an end and it's going to make some people, let me explain something, it's going to make some people mad, it's going to offend your heart, it's going to offend your spirit because all the people you thought were so radical and you thought, I don't know if I, I'm quite there, that's going to be demanded of us because the sword is falling. And the Lord said, are you for me or are you against me? To, to, to come against these powers of hell in this nation and for revival to come, things have got to go. And I just say to you, Holy Spirit, whatever you need to do with me, Lord, just cut it off. I don't want it. Show me, Lord, and I'll hear. Call to me and I'll hear your word, Lord. Hallelujah. I want you to listen. Whenever he sounds his shofar, I want you to lift up your hands. I want you to lift up your voices. And I want you to let the devil know that everything he's put on you is broken off in the name of Jesus. Come on. Jump in. 
Listen, folks, I'm on preaching in just a minute, but we're not in too big of a hurry not to praise the Lord. Just take a few minutes and just keep loving on him and loving on him. Come on. Yes, Lord, we love you, Jesus. Holy, holy, Lord, holy, holy, Lord. <clears throat> holy, holy, Lord, holy, holy, Lord. Se miro retoro ramando le beando corre beato. your Bibles. Just keep standing, please, in honor of the Word. We're going to preach this morning until we get through. Y'all stay with me? Hallelujah. I'm going to go back and recap just a little bit of last week's because I've got a good run on. I've only covered two points. I've got seven points. That means I've got five to go, so I'm going to have to rush. But I want to get it all in this morning because next week I've got another message that I want to bring to you, a powerful message. Whew. Don't miss next Sunday. And don't miss next week of the revival. Amen. I believe Steve Hill's preaching better and better and better all the time. Man, what an anointing on that man. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 25. I know that this is a little bit different from some of those uh, for some of the, those of you that uh, is not really used to the Old Testament and some of you that's new converts, this may be a little bit difficult for you to understand at first. But as you listen, Holy Spirit will take it and he'll show you the truth of it. And you'll understand it as we go along. Amen. Exodus chapter number 25 and verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass. I want you to receive blue, purple, and scarlet, and fine linen and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, and badger skins and shittim wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, 
and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And then it goes on down and it begins to tell what God wanted them to make him. And on everything in that tabernacle worship, there were dimensions, specific dimensions given to Moses, the size of the rods, the length of them, the length of every piece of wood, how they were to be overlaid with what. Everything was measured. The altar was measured, the ark was measured, the box was measured, everything. Everything was measured but one thing. And I'll tell you about that in just a few minutes. You may be seated. What we're doing is we're talking about a journey into the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And uh, I'm going to have to really go through this quickly because I don't want to get bogged down in material that I've already covered. But I'd like to ask, please, as little moving in and out as possible, and we are going to be going well into probably about 1 o'clock. So I want to go ahead and let you know that. I will try to stop by 1 o'clock, no matter where I am. <clears throat> But don't, please don't have any moving in and out because it's so distracting. If you must leave, please go ahead and leave now. And let's don't have any distractions in, in, the, in the preaching of the Word. We're talking about a journey into the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I want to tell you that you will receive an anointing when you get to where God is. Amen? Amen. If you go where God is, if you go where God dwells, and your heart is right, there is a seven-step process that will guarantee you the anointing. In the seven-step process, it is a picture and a pattern that God gave to Moses to reveal to Moses so that the children of Israel could be in the loop of how God thinks, how God sees, how God does, and what God will do and what God will not do. So God began to give the material to Moses that he expected to go into his dwelling place. And I'll just give you these real quick. Don't try to take notes because you won't have time. He talked about gold, and the gold represents his divinity. He talked about silver, and the silver represents his redemption. The brass usually talks about his suffering. He said there's going to be blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen, which is white, and then there's going to be goat's hair. The blue is usually symbolic of Jesus, the Son of God. He came from heaven, the color blue. Purple represents the king and his royalty. Scarlet represents the suffering Savior. Even you remember whenever the spies were let down off of a scarlet rope through Rahab, the prostitute, the harlot. In Israel's early days, as Joshua began to come in and get ready for the walls of Jericho to fall, she let them down on a scarlet rope. And that scarlet is our way of escape. The scarlet, the suffering Savior, is our escape from sin. The fine, line, the fine linen speaks of Jesus, the perfect and the pure man. The goat's hair speaks of Jesus, the prophet. And if you look, we talked about purple, we talked about scarlet and blue and white. And it's, it's ironic that there's four colors there, and there's also four gospels. The Bible says that Matthew, in writing, presented Jesus as king. He presented Jesus as purple. And Luke presented Jesus as the perfect, sinless man, the humanity of Christ. He talked about him in the whiteness the fine linen. And Mark presented Jesus as the suffering Savior. He presented Jesus as the scarlet. And then John represented Jesus and introduced him as the son sent from heaven. And he talked about Jesus, the color blue. The ram's hides dyed red is symbolic. And whenever Abraham turned around and saw that there was a substitute caught in the thicket for his son Isaac, he took Isaac off the altar and there was a ram there and he slew the ram. And that ram skin dyed red took Israel's mind back to Abraham as that skin was dyed red representing the shed blood of that ram and Jesus is to be the sacrificial sacrifice taking the place of any human. So the badger skins also are like porpoise skins. They are very plain. They're not exotic like a raccoon hide or our raccoon skin, you know, fur, uh, leopard skins and other things like that. Nothing that would attract. A badger skin is very plain, very blazo. And if you looked at the tabernacle from outside, you would see 
a tent, a big tent in the wilderness. Well, it really wasn't all that big, but it was a big tent in the wilderness. And it was badger skins all the way out. And in part of that, it was open air. It was called the courtyard. And then as you begin to move past the courtyard into the holy place, it was overlaid with those skins. And then the different colors again were represented. And then after you passed that, you went into the holy place, the most holy place rather, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the priests went in. The high priest went in once a year and offered the, the uh, blood for the sacrifice, uh, as a sacrifice for the people's sins. Now, I want to just tell you this real quick. It's interesting that, as you notice, there was only one gate. That tabernacle in the wilderness had those badger skins all the way around on the outside. Those badger skins were very plain. And looking at the things of God from outside, there's nothing attractive about the things of God. Matter of fact, turn with me real quick to Matthew chapter 13. I want to show you something there while we're talking about this. Matthew chapter number 13. I want to show you something interesting, I feel. Bible here talks about, I'll have to lay my finger on it, I can't see it right at the moment, about the man bought the field, treasure buried in the field. You see that handy? Verse 45. Verse 44. The Bible says again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to treasure hid in a field, the which when a man has found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. Look at this now, verse 44. He talks about a treasure hid in a field, it's hid in a field. So this man, when he's found that treasure, he, he, he hides and for joy there goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And I want to tell you something. We're talking about the things of God here, folks. And in talking about the things of God, when you look at those badger skins outside, you just look at the things of God and you see those old drab badger skins. There's nothing about the things of God to the world that looks attractive. Matter of fact, people wonder, you know, what in the world are they standing out in line for outside that church? Why do they do that? What, what's in there? You know, there's a bunch of fanaticism. They make their judgments without even coming. And to look at it, it looks so drab. You know, how could they sit through that sermon? How could they sit through all that singing? I don't see what they see. That's, that's the badger skins, see, on the outside that the world drives by by the thousands daily and looks over this way. And other churches, and they think, ah, oh, you know, they're just in it for the money and they're just this and that and the other all that old religious stuff, I don't care about that. It's badger skins to the world. The Bible says that the God of this world has blinded the mind of unbelievers. They're blinded. They can't see what we see. You've got to be in Christ to see the things of God. You've got to be in Christ. You've got to come in and see. And boy, once you come in, woo, it's wonderful, isn't it? But you see, the Bible says that this man found a treasure and he found it hidden in a field. And the Bible said he went, he hid it, and he went and sold all that he had. He sold out to buy that field. And I want to tell you this real quick, and I've said this before in years past, but I want you to listen carefully. Friends, there's a lot of things in church that grieves me. You can get hurt in church. You know, you can get eat up and spit out in church. I've got hurt so many times. There's been so many times I've been up behind the pulpit preaching with a broken heart, bleeding. There's been times that I've, I've even contemplated when I first got the ministry in my first church, I saw such a lack of fruit of the spirit and Christians' lives that I found myself one day out in front of the railroad depot. I pulled my car up there and a man had promised me a job at the railroad if I'd ever wanted a job at the railroad. And he said, you can go up quick. And uh, after about a year or so of pastoring, I saw such a lack of fruit in, in Christians' lives. And I thought, my God, if this is all there is in church, you know, man, I'm, I'm bailing out. I, I'm not gonna put my family through this and I don't have to go through this. Man, these people are ruining my days. And I pulled up outside that railroad depot, but the Holy Spirit reminded me whenever I left my secular job and put my hand on that car handle, I said, Lord, I'll never turn and I'll never go back to the things of the world to earn my living by. I'm in the ministry and I'll stay there. Come hell or high water, thick or thin. And I said that in a minute. And I want to tell you something about the things of God. When you look at them, it looks so drab and it looks like, boy, you know, that's so dangerous. 
You know, people, how can you trust yourself to people? Well, you can get hurt in church. But I like what this parable said, and Jesus gave it. It said that a man found a treasure, but he went and sold all that he had to get the field. In order to get the treasure, you've got to take the field. And the field's got barbed wire fence. fence the old fence post is messed up and ransackledy. And there's paper, there's trash, there's beer cans, there's thorns, there's cockleburrows. There's all kinds of trash on that field. But that man knows that in order for him to get that treasure in that field, he's got to take the field along with it. And I want to tell you something about the things of God. If you're going to get what God's got for you, you've got to take all the imperfect saints, you've got to take all the hurt, all the letdown, all the pain that comes with going to church. You see, you're going to get hurt in church, friend. I just want to go ahead and tell you that now. But oh, when you come in, there may be hypocrites, but the Lord is in the church. There may be a bunch of backsliders in the church. There may be a bunch of vipers. There may be even people there that will crucify you. But I want to tell you something. God has chosen to manifest himself through his church on the earth. No, the church is not perfect, but friend, I have seen the treasure in the field, and believe me, it's worth it. Amen? Amen. And so we talked about that. And Jesus is the only gate, and it's interesting that uh, he's the only gate. Now, the outside, as you look around, there's only one entrance to come into that tabernacle worship. There's only one that's on the eastern side. It's called a gate. It's also interesting to notice that as you go into the outer courtyard, there's two things there. There's an altar there where the blood is shed for the sacrificed animals. You look at that altar, and there's just cakes, blood, dried red blood everywhere. As a matter of fact, so much, it's almost turned black. Just cakes, blood everywhere of those sacrifices. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. But then if you notice, you leave past the, the altar and then you leave the laver with the water in it and then you walk into an area. You leave the courtyard where the sunlight lights up everything. You understand? Y'all listening? Follow me closely. Outside, the sunlight lights up everything. Then the natural sunlight lights it up. But then the badger skins are also over the uh, area that encompasses the holy place and the most holy place you've got that area that's covered over the tent covers over that and as you walk in the sunlight no longer lights that area as you walk in there you see a table of shoe bread 12 loaves of frankincense sprinkled all over it and then you walk past that table of shoe bread and you see the golden lampstand and the golden lampstand has oil coming up in that lampstand that lights the inside there so outside you have sunlight inside you have the lampstand that gives light, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And then as you leave there, you go past the shoe bread, and then you go past the lampstand, then you get to the veil. And as you leave the veil, the high priest goes in once a year, and as you leave that veil, then as the blood is applied, the glory comes down, the glory lights that. It represents body, soul, and spirit. But isn't it interesting that the outside has a gate, and as you go into the holy place, it has a door. And then as you go into the most holy place, it has a veil. And the interesting thing about it is, according to tradition, you know what the Jews call the gate? They call the gate the way. You know what the Jews call the door going into the holy place? They call it the truth. And you know what they call the veil that went into the most holy place? You got it. And Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the light. And for people to see that in the wilderness and to have that as a pattern, God told Moses, he said, I want you to make this as a pattern and I want you to put it out there. And every time the Jews would come into that outer courtyard, walk through that gate, they saw the colors. They saw the gate, only one gate. And God's trying to get a message through these people. My son is the way. And then my son is the sacrifice being shed. And then as they went right on down the journey, God's trying to get a message through to them. And they had that in the wilderness all those years, but the word and the revelation never sunk in. And you know, what surprises me about this move of God here that we have is so wonderful but seemingly a lot of this stuff has never sunk into a lot of people. And it worries me. It concerns me that I see people that's here and they come through these doors, but they never get it. 
They think they want to come in here and shake under the power, fall in the floor. But friend, it's not about shaking and it's not about falling. It's about being reintroduced to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's about picking up an anointing to do the works of God in the earth. Because, friend, I'm going to tell you something. There's yokes out there today that psychology won't break and that talking to people won't break and that a pill won't break. There's yokes out there today that only the anointing of the Holy Ghost will break those yokes. Oh, I love this. I'm going to just take just a few minutes here and then i got to run on. But let me just talk to you a little bit about that altar where that blood is. You see, Jesus, I love him so much. How many of y'all love Jesus with me this morning? Do you love him? Isn't he the most remarkable man? You see, the Bible calls him the son of man and the son of God. Two different terms, son of man, son of God. And he's the most remarkable figure. He's wonderful. He is so holy and he is so majestic and so regal. When he came, there was no comeliness about him and people missed him. But when John got to heaven, he said he saw him and he fell at his feet as one dead. He saw him in his glorified, elevated state at the right hand of the Father. And I want to tell you something this morning, folks. There's a lot of folks that serve gods of all kinds. But I'm so happy to know this morning that I stand here in this church and I serve the only risen God. He is Jehovah and his son's name is Yeshua, Jesus. And he is the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And when you walk past that gate and you get out in that courtyard and you see all those colors as you come through the gate, it's there, it says, he's my son. There's the scarlet, he is the suffering savior. There's the purple, he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There's the blue, he's the son of man come down from the father above. There's the white, he is the sinless son of God. So Jesus is the son of man and he's also called the Son of God. But as you walk past the gate, the first thing that catches your eye when you walk past that gate, you can't miss it. The first thing that you see is caked, shed, red blood. Some of it old and some of it fresh. There it is. And the Lord's trying to get the message across right off the bat. This is my son, and I'm going to give him. He's going to give his life as a propitiation for your sins. He's going to be your substitute. He is the ram caught in the thicket, and he's going to be slain. He's going to shed his blood, and his blood is going to give you access into my presence where my glory is and where my anointing can rest upon you. So the first statement is, he's my son, and he's going to shed his blood for you. And I want to just tell you this real quick, and I'll cover it again that I covered last week just for a few minutes. And I'm not bound to a clock this morning. Bless God, I'm going to go ahead right now and look at it one last time, and I'm going to take it off because I'm going to preach till I get through. Yeah. Hey, look. Hey, friend, let me tell you something. Why not? Why not? Those ribs will hold till you leave church. Amen? And this is my only shot. You know, I go off. I went off last Sunday night and preached in Jacksonville and last week in Georgia. I just preached till I got through, and I said, well, when I go home, I'm going to preach till I get through. Those people stay with me. I know you'll stay with me too, won't you? So I'm going to preach till I get through. And so if anybody leaves, I know you don't love me. Okay. So they, they, you, saw the, you saw the blood that was shed there, and I want to just talk to you for a few minutes about Jesus and his blood. You see, one of the reasons why worship is so important in these days is because Jesus is worthy of all of our worship. He is the Lord, and he is the king. He is worthy of our worship. You know, I told you last week, and real quick, about Genesis 1 and 1 and Genesis 1 and 2. Some think there's a gap between there. I don't know. I'm not a theologian. But, uh, you know, it does make you wonder because the Bible says that in Isaiah chapter 14, it talked about that the devil made those, he made those statements about, I will, I will, I will. And he wanted the place where God sat in the recesses of the north. And he said, I can do a better job. I'm going to take over. I will be like the most high. And so there was an insurrection against God in heaven. And God cast the devil out and a third of his angels. As a matter of fact, some of those angels were so wicked that they even came into the daughters of men. And God had to bind some of those angels, fallen angels, into chains, Peter said, in the lower abyss until the last day judgment. But Satan still has about a third of the angels that fell from heaven that God had created to worship him. Satan still has about a third of those. 
And so the devil will do army. And then we read about in Revelation chapter 12 where it said that Michael and his angels warred and the dragon and his angels warred. So Michael warred against Satan in the book of Revelation and their angels and those two great powers fought. Now you've got to understand that Lucifer used to be an archangel also. You see, Michael was an archangel. He's the archangel that usually does the fighting for Israel. He's God's warring angel. Gabriel was an archangel. And he's the proclaimer of God's news and he's the announcer of God usually. And uh, it appears that Lucifer, the fallen archangel, was in charge somehow because he was created with tabrets and pipes on the inside of him. It appears that he had something to do with music and maybe worship. And that's why worship has always been so important to Lucifer because evidently as he was leading in heaven the worship toward God and he heard all these praises and all these adulations and all these words going, being sung to the Lord, he was jealous of that and he wanted that worship. As a matter of fact, whenever Jesus was here on the earth, the Bible says that the devil went down and took Jesus up, picked him up, and took him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said, look out, yonder and see all those kingdoms. And he said, if you'll just bow down and worship me. Satan is so covetous for worship. He wants worship so bad. He said, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. And Jesus went through every trial and temptation that Adam went through, and he passed every one of them. Where Adam fell and where Eve fell, Jesus passed them. Hallelujah. Now, the thing that I love about this is you see, evidently God had cast the devil to the ground because whenever you find Adam in the book of um, Genesis in the early part, uh, God told him, said, don't touch this tree. And then, of course, as you know, the devil got into the, the serpent and the serpent used to walk as a beast of the field. And so the serpent went down and began to talk to Adam. And uh, he was trying to seduce Adam and Satan was in the serpent. And the Satan was on the earth then. He was cast out to the earth then, even in the first part of Genesis. I believe that happened possibly in Ezekiel 28 or maybe even Isaiah 14, but for surely Ezekiel 28 where the Bible says that God cast him to the ground. And so when Adam is placed here, God doesn't protect Adam from the influence of evil. Now Adam is created perfect and he's sinless, but he's created with a will. And so as God put Adam in that garden, he put him there as a free moral agent with the powers of choice. And God never segregated Adam away from the lure and the seductiveness of temptation. And I want to tell you something else. Many of you worry about a lot of these new converts and you say, oh, but what's going to happen to these converts? Listen, the same power of Christ that's able to keep you is able to keep these new converts. And God never creates a hot house plant. God never made the church to be a hot house plant to be kept in a greenhouse to get all this tender, loving care to be nurtured in a certain environment. God saves us, friend, and puts us out in the world in the coldest and the most wicked and the most evil environments. But there's a seed in us, thank God, as we get into the Word of God and the power of God and the glory of the Holy Ghost, that seed will grow under any circumstances. And God is not going to keep you and segregate you from temptation. And the Bible said that as the, as the devil came and tempted Adam, and Adam succumbed. The Bible says he wasn't deceived. The woman was deceived, but Adam wasn't deceived. And the reason he'd been into the fruit was that she might be saved through childbearing. He loved her. He's a picture of Christ going after the church that was in a fallen condition. He was not deceived, but the woman was. And he'd been into that forbidden fruit so that he might maintain her level. He might come into her and she might be saved through childbearing. And it's not the kind of salvation that we know of through the blood of the Lamb. So... The devil, whenever the devil came up and tempted Adam, and I just want to give you this real quick. I don't have time to labor here. But whenever the devil came up and tempted Adam, I want you to notice something, friend. This is so powerful. The devil saw what God had invested in Adam. Adam was so powerful. You can't imagine how powerful man used to be. Looking out over the sea of faces here this morning, we can't imagine as humans that's now been restored by the blood of Christ and we're growing and our mind is being renewed, we can't imagine how it was before man fell. He didn't have to be educated. God just brought the animals to him. He said, that's a hippopotamus, and he gave them their biological, zoological names, the plants, the animals. He knew biology, he knew zoology, he knew everything. He even had the power to stand flat-footed on the earth, and he could speak to the firmament, birds that flew in the firmament. He could speak to them. If anything got out of line, he was in charge. As a matter of fact, if you want to look at it technically, I believe that Adam was in charge of the universe as we know it in our sphere. He was in charge of it. 
So when the devil, lurking about, saw the kind of power that Adam had, the devil thought, aha! So as a fallen stripped archangel, and I talked about as a soldier will stand before general or before a major or colonel and he stands there at attention and they strip him of all of his medals and they strip him of all of his stripes or they strip him of his rank. They leave him with his uniform but they strip everything off. God stripped everything off the devil and cast him to the ground. And the devil was here on the earth stripped but he was covetous of what he saw that God had invested in Adam. And God had invested great power and great authority in Adam. So when the devil seduced Eve and Adam fell because of her, Adam gave to the devil on a silver platter his Adamic anointing and his Adamic authority. So where the devil was once cast to the ground, now man not only had power over the ground, but he had power in the atmosphere, the firmament, the heavens. That's why the Bible says today that the devil is the ruler of the powers and the principalities and rulers of darkness in the heavenlies. How did he get up into the heavenlies? Because he stole an Adamic authority. He stole Adam's authority. But I want to tell you something. Jesus came to this earth, <laughs> sent to the city of Bethlehem from the from the womb of Mary. And he was born on this earth into a manger. And that child, when he came to this earth, angel Gabriel proclaimed, peace on earth, peace on earth, goodwill to men. God said, I got good news for you. I have found, you have found favor. I have sent you goodwill. I have sent you the second Adam. Where the first Adam failed, this one that's coming is not going to fail you. I have sent you another Adam. And that Adam, whew, that Adam came to this earth, friend, and he lived a godly, holy life. He never failed. He never had sexual with anybody. He never told a lie. He never failed his father. He walked under obedience. He said, what I hear, I speak. What I see, I do. I have not come to do the will of myself, but I have come to do the will of my father. And then Jesus went to Gethsemane and he, he took that cup and his hand was shaken and he said, God, if it's possible, let this thing pass from me. But if not, I'd rather please you than please myself. And he drank it to the last drop, all the dregs of it. And that cup led him to be taken and whipped, his beard to be pulled out, spit in his face, blindfolded, slapped, and his garment stripped off of him and hung on a cross. And he was sinless. And I remember reading in the Bible where well, the Bible said that he made a number of statements on the cross and he said, Father, Forgive them for they don't know what they do. And he told the thief, he said, today you should be with me in paradise. He said, woman, behold your son. He said, son, behold your mother. John, behold your mama. And then one of the things he said right before he died, he made another statement right before he died, but this is one right before it. And he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From the time he came from his mother's womb, he knew that anointing of the Holy Ghost, the presence of the Holy Ghost. He was a man, the Son of Man, anointed. Even though he was the Son of God, he came and walked in an anointing. And as he hung on Calvary, the Holy Ghost stayed with him until God took and laid the sins of the world on his shoulders. But also, the Holy Spirit left him for another reason because now, and he said, why have you forsaken me? He didn't say, why does it feel like you've forsaken me? He said, no. He said, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the Bible says shortly after that, he said, it is finished. And he dropped his head. But I'm going to tell you what happened whenever the Holy Ghost lifted off of him, friend. It wasn't the Son of God that went down into the underworld. It was that last Adam that went down in the underworld. He went down there as that last Adam perfect, the one that never sinned. And he walked up to the devil that had stole Adam's anointing and Adam's authority. And that last Adam walked up to the first Adam 
and I said, hand them over. Give them here. I've come back away from you what you stole from my man Adam. And I want to just share this with you real quick, and I know I've got to move on. I don't want to get bogged down. But then the Holy Ghost was waiting on Jesus whenever he was dead and in the tomb. The Holy Ghost was waiting on him because the Bible said the same spirit that raised up Christ from the dead, when that last Adam had taken away the keys of death and hell away from the devil, that stole Adam's authority. He let him keep his office, but he took away his authority as far as the church is concerned and the believers are concerned. And the Holy Ghost was waiting right there. And whenever it came time, after Jesus had defeated the devil, the Bible said he spoiled them, made show of them openly, spoiled powers and principalities and made a show of them openly. And the Bible says that the Lord resurrected him. The Holy Ghost was there to raise Jesus from the dead. Now, after you walk past that altar, Jesus conquered so much for us. And let me just say one more thing before I move on. Somebody might say, well, Brother Kilpatrick, why did Jesus leave the devil and let him have his office, maintain his office? Because the Lord is going to let us stay in that same environment while we're here on the earth to teach us how to win. You see, the devil has been defamed and he's been defeated by Christ on Calvary for the church. But now the Lord wants you to take the victory that the Lord has given you and he wants you to conquer. And he wants you to triumph in the victory that Jesus has won for you. Now listen to me very carefully, friends. Do you think for a minute that I'd go off and leave my little old boys, John, Michael, and Scott? Do you think I'd leave them somewhere? Even out there where I live, do you think I'd leave Brenda and John, Michael, and Scott and my little grandsons and my daughter-in-law? Do you think I'd leave them out there and me take off if I knew there was something lurking out there in them woods that's going to destroy them? Do you think I'd leave them? No. Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives with the disciples and he started going up gradually. And he left them. He said, I tell you what, he said, wherever you go, he said, you cast out devils in my name. And he said, you preach the gospel in all the world. And he said, you're going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, and et cetera, et cetera. He felt so secure about the victory that he had won that whenever he left, he felt like he left the church equipped with anything to make them more than conquerors for that old evil devil that was left here on the earth, that Jesus left here with a clear mind and said, they'll be all right. But I want to tell you something else too real quick before I move on. This is something I didn't tell you last week. Jesus stripped the devil, but he also, when he saved us, he gave us a rank higher than Adam had in the beginning. You know why I say that? Because Adam was never seated with Christ in heavenly places. And Adam never had the name of Jesus. And Adam never had the blood of Jesus. Now, we've got a much better covenant, the Bible says, and we've got the name of Jesus, we've got the blood of Jesus, and we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. So Jesus feels real secure about leaving us down here. Friend, let me tell you something. He said, nothing by any means shall harm you. Is that what he said? So those of you that's afraid of the devil, stop being afraid of the devil. God's left you equipped to be more than conquerors through him that loved you and gave his life for you. Amen? All right, number three. Let me go on, number three. Hallelujah. When you go past the altar, what's the next thing you run into? The laver. What is the laver? The laver contains water, and it's where they would wash. Go with me real quick to Exodus chapter number 30. Exodus chapter number 30, and I want you to look at verse 17. How many of y'all is worried this morning? How many of y'all is worried about the devil this morning? Somebody said, Brother Kilpatrick, the other night you cut up that voodoo doll. On Friday night up there on the platform, I got a letter. I opened up a letter the other day. Somebody wrote me a letter and said, oh, I'm so concerned about you, Brother Kilpatrick. My heart never skipped a beat, friend. Because you know, Jesus knew when he left this earth that there's going to be voodoo all circulating around against his people. But Jesus wouldn't have left me if he felt like a voodoo doll could overcome me. He wouldn't have left me. He'd have said, I'm going to stay down here with old John because somebody's going to put a voodoo doll on him and put a curse on him. But friend, I'm going to tell you something. They ain't no voodoo doll. They ain't no devil. They ain't no demon going to be able to hurt the people of God. Amen. Can you say amen? 
I want to tell you this morning, I ain't worried about the devil. I'm not worried about temptation. I'm not worried about trials. I'm not worried about fiery darts of the devil. Why? Because Jesus said, I'm going to leave you some armor. I'm going to leave you some armor, and I'm going to leave you a name. I'm going to leave you the blood, and I'm going to leave you my word. You're in good shape, son. I'll see you after a while. Amen. I'm not worried about it, friend. Don't you be worried about it. Let them bring another voodoo doll, and I'll cut it up too. Man. And if there's any witches in here this morning, I want to tell you something else. The glory of God's so strong in here, you can't circulate nothing around here anyway. Hallelujah. Hey, let it be known that this is off limits to any kind of powers of darkness, principalities, and rulers, and witches, and warlocks. This is holy ground. Woo! This is holy ground. Hallelujah. Chapter 30, look at verse 17. It said, and the Lord spake unto Moses and said, You shall make a laver of brass, and his foot also of brass, to wash withal. And you shall put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, and you shall put water therein. And Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. And when they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Look at that. They shall wash with water that they die not. Do you see that? If you don't mind underlining that, just sort of make a little pencil circle around it or underline that. Look at it. It says, They shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord, so shall they wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statue forever to them, even to him, and his seed throughout all generations. Now what does this labor represent? This labor represents glorious, clean water and what is the word? The Bible says that the word washes us with water. Amen? So after you come through the gate, which is Jesus, and it shows you the fourfold ministry of Christ, and then after you come to the altar where you see Jesus as the sacrifice and the lamb slain from the foundations of the world, next you come to something very important. Friend, let me tell you something. Many of you talk about the blood, the blood, the blood, but you don't pay any attention to the labor. I want to tell you, you better start paying attention to the Word of God. The blood is powerful, but you also need the Word. Can you say amen? The Word is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And unless we clean our lives with the Word, you'll die. God may have done a great work in you whenever you got saved. God may have broken drug addiction off of you. He may have broken pornography off of you and all kinds of things off of you. But I want to tell you, unless you get in the Word after the blood and after your salvation experience, unless you go to that labor and wash in that Word and get that Word in you and let God wash you continually, you'll die. How many of you knows if you don't feed off the Word of God, you'll die? And you know the tragic thing is today, so many people that call themselves Christians in churches are dead and they don't know it. And there's nothing no more dead than a charismatic or a Pentecostal that's supposed to have all the gospel and the full gospel and they still talk about the blood but they've neglected the word. When they clap their hands, there's no anointing. When they preach, there's no punch. And they testify, there's no salt in their tongue. And whenever they sing and worship, it's done out of the head and not out of the heart. You're dead. Why? Because you've neglected the labor with the word. I want to tell you something else. This is the only piece of furniture in all of God's tabernacle in the wilderness that had no dimensions. The altar was measured. The sticks were measured said what they would be over covered with. Everything was measured but this labor. What does that mean? You can have as much of the Word of God as you want. As much as you can consume. And I'm going to tell you, the more of the Word of God you get, the more it grows. The more of the Word of God you get, the more it compounds itself. And one thing that you learn leads to other truths. And it's inexhaustible. You never exhaust the Word of God. So there was no dimension for this labor in that Word. I want to give you some scriptures real quick. 
Friend, I'm not talking about staying on the milk either. How many of you have read in the Bible where, the, where Paul talked about the milk of the Word and he talked about the meat of the Word? How many of you know you need to graduate after a while from the milk of the Word to the meat of the Word? Let me ask you this this morning, just, just to give me a hand, a uh, show of hands. How many of you love the Word of God? Now, I'm not talking about respect the Bible and give it a prominent place in your house, but how many of you love to feed from the Word of God? Let me see your hand. And there's a difference between the milk of the Word and the meat of the Word. I want to give you two scriptures real quick. Go to Deuteronomy. I want to just give you these real, real quick. I don't have time to spend there. But go to Deuteronomy chapter number 32. Look at Deuteronomy 32 and verse 13. Look at verse 12. It said, The Lord alone did lead him. This is in Deuteronomy. The Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him to ride high on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock. See that? He made him to suck honey out of the rock. Now, you want an explanation for that? Go to Job. Go to Job quickly. Everybody go to Job. Chapter 29. Job 29. Look at this. I love this passage of Scripture. May this be true in your life and in mine. Job chapter 29 and verse 6. When I washed my steps with butter, whew, the rock poured me out rivers of oil. You see that? I'm going to give you a chance to look at it. When I washed my steps with butter, the rock, which is the Lord in his word, the rock poured me out what? Rivers of oil. You know what oil represents? The anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit. Now let me explain that verse to you in Job. It says, when I wash my steps with butter. Now do you know what that means, when I wash my steps with butter? What did I tell you a while ago? The milk is referred to as, as two things, or the word is referred to as two things, what? Meat and milk. You know what a handler of milk does? If you want to get cream, and butter out of milk, you take that milk and you churn it. How many of you ever had an old home churn? You know how you used to churn? Mama used to make me set that churn. I'd wrap my legs around it and I'd take that stopper thing, you know, with that cross in the bottom of it, go up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. You know what I'm doing? I'm taking that milk and totally disseminating that milk, tearing that milk apart and getting everything I can, I'm enriching that milk until I'm getting butter out of it. You know what Job said? Read it. Look at it again. When I wash my steps with what? With butter. When I wash my steps with butter and the rock poured me out rivers of oil. When you wash your steps with butter, it's somebody that loves the Word, and you've enriched your steps. You've gotten off the milk, and you've enriched your steps. You see, the Bible says, Thy Word is a what? A light unto my path, and a lamp unto my what? Feet. Thy Word. And it said, when I washed my steps, wash my steps with butter, when you get highly qualified in the word when you get highly seasoned in the word and you take the milk that God gives you he gives you first his word in milk form and you, it's palatable you drink it it's easy it's, you drink it but after you get the milk easy God after a while wants you to work that milk tear that milk apart churn that milk on the inside of you stir up that milk on the inside of you stir up that pure mind Churn that milk on the inside of you. And first you as you know, thy word is a light unto my path and a lamp unto my feet. He said, when I wash my steps with butter, whoo, you want to live a life of victory, friend? 
get in the Word, go to that laver, and get enough of that water out of that laver and wash your hands and wash your feet. Get washed in the Word of God, and after a while, God will just glide you along the path of life on a slippery path of butter. Amen? It'll take the, it'll take the effort. How many of you believe you can walk in victory? Jesus walked in butter. Matter of fact, I won't get into that. Yeah, I will too, just for a second. The Bible says this, that when Jesus came, it says whenever he wanted to know the difference between right and wrong, you ever read that? Whenever he wanted to know the difference choose between right and wrong, it said he ate butter and honey. Butter and honey. I don't have time to go no further into that. Let's go on. Here's what Job said. Job said, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. After you're washed in the blood, you've got to get founded in the word, friends. You've got to get established in God's word. You've got to know it is written. You've got to know what God says, why God says it. You've got to know what God thinks. You've got to know the mind of God and you learn it through the word and you churn that word, that milk of the word until after a while God begins to grease your path with butter. And Job said, I have esteemed the words of thy mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, I'm so hungry, God, after your word, I'd rather be in your word and hear your words than my necessary food. Ecclesiastes 8 and 5 says, He who loves and keeps thy word shall feel no evil. Let me share that with you again. He who loves and keeps thy word shall feel no evil no evil. Psalms 119 verse 165 says, Great peace have they who love thy law and nothing shall offend them. Did you hear that? How many of you listening? Listen to this. Psalms 119 and verse 165. Great peace. Great peace have they who love thy law or thy word and nothing shall offend them. People that get offended are people that are not founded. People that get offended are people that are not founded. Peter said, get established in present truths. In other words, before you go on and try to learn other truths, get established in present truth. Before you try to move on from that labor and go into that bread and that frankincense and before you try to go on into the lampstand and the incense and the golden altar and all that stuff, before you try to move on, get established and churn the milk until God gives you butter. Woo! They, great peace, have they that love thy law, thy word, and they shall not be offended. Now, I got to hurry on. Let me, let me just say this, though, before I do. If you're empty of the word, you're full of the world. Friend, let me tell you something. You can't be empty of the word and be empty of the world at the same time. You see, the more your level begins to decrease of the word, the same level is the same level as the world begins to come in and take the place of what is exempted in your life. There is no void. There is no nether world and an in between where you're playing between two different worlds and you're neutral. The more you're full of the word, the less of the world you have in you. But the more you neglect the word, the more the world will come in and take over the place that God has in you of what should be the word. So if you're empty of the word, you're full of the world. And if you're empty of the word, you're full of the world's music. If you're empty of the word, you're full of the philosophies and the reasoning of the world. That's why it's so hard a lot of times for people coming in this revival that's not walking in butter and their path is not full of butter, it's, it's why a lot of times when people come in this revival, they can't receive what's going on is because they're so full of the world. They don't have the word in them. When people come in this place and they're full of the word, their spirit bears witness instantly, God's in this place. But the people that come in here that are empty of the word and full of the world, it takes them some time, two, three, four, five services before they can begin to sense what God is doing. I want to be one of those when something happens, I can be so full of the word, I can say, yes, Lord. 
I see that. I see you over yonder in that corner, Lord. I see you up there in that, Lord. But the more you got the world in you, friend, the more you're going to have to struggle with this revival. Amen? Hallelujah. Job said, when you had your walk influenced by the wealth of the word, the rock will pour you out rivers of oil. Ooh, don't you love that? He said, when you had your walk influenced by the wealth of the word, the butter of the word, he said, the rock will pour you out rivers of oil. You want an anointing in your life? Come through the gate, Jesus. That's the only way. He's the start. No man will come into what God has for them without first coming through Jesus. Don't try the church. Don't try the pastor. And don't try the word first. You've got to get right with Christ first. Amen? And then after you come through that gate, then you're going to love and worship his blood. And I want to tell you something else before I move off of that. Friend, if the blood of Jesus wasn't so important, why is the scriptures in the Old and New Testament both full of blood? There's people that wants to cut off the Old Testament from the New Testament and say, well, that was the law. I beg your pardon, friend. The Old Testament is full of blood, gory blood, bulls and goats and turtles and pigeons and all kinds of things shed their blood and God was painting a picture of his son that would hang on Calvary and shed his blood. And if the blood is not important in your religion, I want to ask you, why did it pour forth from Jesus' body in five locations? if the blood isn't important. And you'll never understand that labor and you'll never want to bathe your hands and your feet in that labor of the word until you love that blood. You neglect that blood, forget the labor. The word will never mean anything to you. Next, you pass the labor. This is interesting. I want to stay here for a minute tonight and talk about this this morning, whatever day it is. You pass the labor. And now, you leave the sunlight. You leave the natural, worldly outside lights. You walk in the door. When you walk in the door, you walk into the holy place. And inside that holy place, there's a table there of shoe bread. Twelve loaves. And the Bible says it's sprinkled with frankincense. It smelled great. Oh, let me spend a little bit of time here this morning. Woo, there's a lot of people, friend, that love this revival. They smell that bread. <sighs> Brother Kilpatrick, this is what I've been longing for. I said, oh, glory to God. I'm so glad. Oh, Brother Kilpatrick, this is the greatest thing. Oh, my Lord, I've never seen nothing like it. God's in this place. I said, yeah, I know it. He's here. Mm. Oh, Jesus, this is wonderful. See that bread representing the word? It's got that frankincense on it, and it just smells up the place. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Oh. Oh, I love this, Brother Kilpatrick. This is so good. It's good to smell. But when you break it off and you eat it, it's bitter. And if you want to move on to the lampstand where you get revelation of the Word of God, you've got to be willing to undergo persecution because of the Word. I'm going to say that again. A lot of people says, oh, God, show me revelation. He said, I will if you can take the persecution. Oh, God, show me your glory. God said, I will if you can go through the stages. But you see, God, brother, let me tell you something about the Lord. He's got ways and means, and he's got stages and categories that some of these things will sling you off. You say, oh, I want the glory. Don't we all? but can you stand the glory? And God will see to it whether or not you can stand the glory by taking you through the successive steps. And so you get in there to that table of shoe bread, and there's that bread, and there's 12 loaves of them, and it's got that frankincense on there, and that frankincense stands for persecution. Jesus said, blessed are you when you're not offended because of persecution. Hear me? Let me tell you something about this revival 
And let me tell you something about your Christian walk. Yeah, boy, Christianity's wonderful. I love it. I love it. Yeah, it has a lot of trappings that I think is absolutely wonderful. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. You'll catch the devil for serving God. And you'll catch the devil for living the Word of God, too. And if you don't think so, you just try it for a while. See, you've got to wash your hands and your feet that you die not. What God's saying there about that labor is you've got to get into the Word that you don't die because after the blood, the Lord sets you free and makes you alive under the things of God, but the labor perpetuates your life by getting in the Word. So after you're perpetuated and you've gotten the Word now and you love the Word, next you walk into that holy place and there's a table there with bread and that bread also means other things like fellowship and other things like that. But I'm talking about that bread represents the Word of God also, but the frankincense represents persecution. And that leads me to another passage of Scripture. Turn to Mark. Go there real quick. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. I got some important things to tell you, friends, so I want you to stick with me here for a minute. Mark chapter 4, look at verse 16. Mark chapter 4, verse 16. Jesus speaking here about the parables. He's talking about the parable of the sower. Jesus said, These are they likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately they receive it with gladness. Look this way. How many people in this place have received the word gladly? Oh, Brother Steve, that was the greatest message. Oh, my God, what a service. Whew, man, I tell you, that I'm going to join this church. Oh, good, 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 great. But then after a while, verse 17 says, they have no root in themselves. And so endure but for a little time afterward when affliction or persecution arises why because of the word's sake immediately they're offended oh oh uh -huh. there's your sword brother Lindell. there's your sword see that's where the sword comes in and it separates it separates it segregates the people that's going to be willing to take persecution and affliction because of the word's sake. And if you can withstand that, God will then lead you into the golden lampstand where you get revelation. But you, God's not going to trust revelation to somebody that's not willing to suffer for his word's sake. You understand that? Oh, everybody wants all these great revelations. But I want to tell you, you can't handle revelation if you can't handle persecution. Because you see, the more the word you get, the more responsible you become before God. God holds you accountable and responsible for what you know. And God's not going to give you the whole dose of what he wants you to know unless you're tested to see if you're going to be able to handle persecution. Let me just give you a couple of examples real quick. Persecution can come in a lot of forms. Maybe you come to this revival and you sit out there and you say, oh, I love this church, brother. I love this revival. Brother Kilpatrick, I just love you. I want to be part of this church. I want to join. Can I, be, can I join this church, brother Kilpatrick? Sure, you can join. Oh, we're so glad to have you. God bless you. You see, like right now, I'm looking over this church, and this place is full. There's people sitting out here, and you're from all walks of life, you're from all backgrounds, and you're from all geographies. But I want to tell you something, friend. Everybody listen to me real close. Every man that's sitting in these pews, and every woman, and every young person sitting in these pews this morning is in this thing for yourself. I can't do it for you, and you can't do it for me. I'm here because I want to be, and you're here because you want to be. But I'm going to tell you, persecution's going to come if you serve God and you cling to his word. Persecution and affliction's going to come, but we're going to see whether or not you're going to still be in these pews six months from now. Will you still be here six months from now saying to me and looking so lovingly and fondly in my eyes as you pump my hand almost off, oh, I just love this place. Well, let's see how you talk six months from now because the devil's going to use some people and some people's going to start persecuting you. And just as soon as you start telling people something like, the Lord showed me something, they're going to say, you stupid idiot, you one of them. And it's going to be people you love and people you need their respect. And it's going to be people you look up to and they're going to start criticizing you. And then if you can get offended, you are too shallow. 
How many of you made up your mind this morning to get your roots down deep? Woo! Friend, I'm talking about no matter what comes, no matter who does what, no matter who says what, no matter who hurts you, no matter who blesses you, I'm in this thing for the long haul. The Bible said Jesus gave it again. Let's look at it one more time. Chapter 6. Look at it one more time and I'm going to move off of it. Chapter 4, rather. Look at verse 16. Verse 17, it says, They have no root in themselves, and they endure but for a time. Look this way. I've seen people already in this revival. This thing's been going on 15 months. I want everybody to look this way now. Listen to me. Look at me and listen to me. Give me your best ear for a minute. I've seen people so far in 15 months of revival that they came and planted themselves on a pew but they're not here this morning. Where are they? They're pouting. They're offended. They're bent out of shape with somebody. Maybe me. Because I called them down or wouldn't let them do so and so and they've been out of shape and they're not here. But they have to understand if they're gonna grow in God, they have to come under leadership. And they have to come under a federal headship and they have to come under a covering. And God places a covering over people and you better listen to that covering. If that covering is wrong, God will take care of it with a covering. But don't you buck up against the covering. But there's some people here this morning that endured for a little while, but they're not here this morning. Where are they? Will they ever come back? Who knows? I hope so. But the revival moves on. I said the revival moves on. Go ahead. The revival moves on. The church of the living God moves on. We're going on. The glory is still here. The dove's still here. Where are they? I don't know. Brother Kilpatrick, are you going after them? As much as in me is possible without negotiating with them and trying to get them back on any terms because I'm not going to lay a bunch of cards on the table and try to coax people back in a revival where God says they're shallow and they're not going to make it anyway. Y'all with me? He said they have no root. The seed burst open and the green shoots come out and they look real promising. Oh, they're going to make a good person on the prayer team. Oh, they're going to make a great person one day to serve on the board. But after their seed burst open and that little shoot, that little green thing comes out, immediately there's no root goes down and no soil. Not established. Persecution comes. Somebody looks at them wrong. Somebody says something wrong. Somebody says, you can't do this. Somebody says, you can't do that. And they say, I'm out of here. I'll see you later. You know what we say? See you later. We're going on. Friend, let me tell you something. I have made up my mind. Hear me. I have made up my mind. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody does. I don't care if two-thirds of this crowd falls off. I don't care if it falls down to 10. I'm going on with God. I made up my mind. I made up my mind. I'm going on with God. Look, we was going on with God before this revival came. And after this revival's moved on, I'm still going to be going on with God whether it's here or somewhere else. I'm going to go on with God. Why? Because I hope I got some roots. Now, the next thing is the lampstand. After you pass the table of showbread and you're biting that frankincense, you say, oh, it smells so good, but you bite into it and it's bitter. If you can handle that bitterness and that persecution and that affliction, you're on the way, friend, to the anointing. Because the next thing is a golden lampstand. And the golden lampstand was measured, and it had oil coming up through it. And that oil come up through it was lit, and it was a fire. That was a fire that God gave that was a revelation fire. It wasn't lit by the sun outside. You see, when you get inside there, that's where the philosophies of man won't work. When you get inside that holy place, that's where the vain imaginations of man will never like that place, friend. When you get to that golden lampstand, that's where God gives revelation. You know, there's three ways to see. 
One way to see is I look around here and I see that dove up there. I see the blue behind it. I see the red circle around it. I see the green leaf in that dove's mouth. I say, I see. How many of y'all see that? I remember when I was going to school, number two. My kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Huff, she taught me mathematics. I mean, my first grade teacher, my second grade teacher, Miss Smith, they taught me mathematics and they showed me on the board. Two plus two equals four, and I didn't get it. And they took a little time with me, and they said, two plus two equals four. I said, oh, I see. You can see physically. You can see mentally. I saw that mathematical problem solved mathematically. I saw it mentally. But there's a third way you can see. My pastor took me one day in the upstairs Sunday school room and he began teaching me the word. And the first thing he taught me was the adorable Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And as he began to teach me the adorable Godhead about God three in one, like water, vapor, and ice, all H2O, but all still the same, three different offices, I said, oh, I see. Now, friend, I've never seen Jesus walking on the earth. You've never seen Jesus walking on the earth in that dispensation when he walked here 2,000 years ago. But in my spirit, someone one day, God used him to preach a message to me. And when I was sitting out there as a boy, I heard the gospel preached. And you know what I said? I see. He's the son of God. He's the propitiation. He's my substitute. He was sinless, and God sent him to die for me. And I said, I see. You know what that was? Revelation knowledge. And just as God taught you that revelation, as you get to that golden lampstand, if you're willing to take the persecution and the affliction because of the word, and you're willing to swallow that bitterness, then God will let you walk into the place where that golden lampstand burns, and God will show you revelation, powerful revelation. You'll begin to see the work and the character of the Holy Spirit, then you'll begin to see the plot of the Word of God from Genesis all the way down through the book of Revelation. Then you'll begin to see a, a divine healing, and then you'll begin to see and understand other things like the atonement and remission, and you'll begin to understand all kinds of things. And then you begin to grow. And you, see, God's not going to let you have that if you have no root in yourself. So what tests you to see whether or not you have a root in yourself is that affliction and that persecution. And if you'll stand there and say, come hell or high water, I don't care what you say, and nobody else says, I'm going on with God. God will say, come on in here, boy, I want to show you something. Amen? Yeah. Come on in here, I want to show you something. And all of a sudden, you walk in there, and there's that lamp burning, and God says, stick your head under that lamp for a minute. And you say, "Woo, Lord, my God. But then, let me hurry up. I got I to hurry. The next one is a golden altar. And the golden altar is where the incense is burned. You know what? When they put that incense on there, you ever read about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10 where they offered strange fire, strange incense? Mike Brown was telling me this morning that the fire jumped out from the most holy place, the holy of holies, and it jumped out through the veil and just disintegrated Nadab and Abihu. The fire jumped out of the whole, most holy place into the holy place and got them before they could even walk in because they offered strange incense. That golden altar, they had rocks in the Middle East where they would take that incense from. Let me just share this with you real quick. I don't know if it's true or not, but I've read it. I've read it several different places. I don't know if it's true or not. Just, let's just consider it for a minute. Where did Israel get those rocks? Well, that incense came from. Where'd they get those rocks? Because they tell us that it came from the Red Sea. Those rocks would come from the Red Sea and deep in the wilderness. Well, they didn't have time to mine while they was in the wilderness. And they, they couldn't dive. They didn't have diving equipment for the wilderness and the Red Sea. Where'd they get them? Maybe they brought them with them out of Egypt. I don't know. But you know, it may be possible when they was walking through on dry ground through the Red Sea. God gave him a miracle and said, y'all see them rocks laying down there, boys? Pick you up a few of them. Every, every man, pick him up some rocks while you're walking through there. Could have been. Who knows? 
Friend, God will give you some worship and some praise while you're going through some trials and some tribulations. While you're going through one victory, God says, here's a rock because the next time you get in a hard place, I want you to begin to burn this as a reminder of what I brought you out of last time. Amen? How many of you know if we get one victory and the next time we go through another problem, God wants to remind us of the last victory? Friend, I want to tell you something this morning. God is the God of victory of your present problem like he was your past problem. David said, I remember the lion and I remember the bear. I've got a rock for the lion and i got a rock for the bear. And this old giant will be no different. And there was incense that went up. Well, when you get to that golden altar and that incense is put on there, here's what would happen. The priest would stand before that golden altar and that incense would be, begin to burn. And that incense represents our worship and our praise. And as that incense is put on that altar and it begins to burn, God says, now I'm ready to bring you into my presence through the veil. And you know what? As that veil was parted, what would always precede that priest end to the presence of God, that smoke of that praise would always precede him. You know what the protocol of heaven is? If the king or the queen came in this building this morning, before, if I knew they was coming before they came, I would teach you the protocol of how to receive a king or a queen. And we would stand up, and the ladies would do a certain thing, and the men would do a certain thing because it would be protocol of how to receive majesty. And God said, if you're going to come into my presence where my glory is and where my power is, the way you come in is just like out there over those doors in the foyer. It says, enter into his gates with and his courts with praise. Don't you enter belly aching. Don't you enter into the courts of the Lord belly aching and griping and grumbling and complaining about your wife and telling God all about what's wrong. The Bible said, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. God, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful I know you. I'm so thankful I can come before you. Oh, God, I love you. And as that priest would begin to go into the holy of holies, what would always precede him would be that smoke of that worship. You know what's happening in Brownsville? God's not only sent revival to Brownsville, friend, but something else he sent. He sent a real liberty of praise and worship, which leads me to believe that as we continue to develop this praise and worship and we continue to lift our voices and put our heart in our voices and put our imagination and our voices and our heart all together and we begin to visualize the Lord and love the Lord and revere and honor and esteem Him as we highly develop that, that worship, one day God's going to lift that veil and he's going to say, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. The last thing is, number seven, he would be taken through that veil. The smoke would precede him in the presence of Almighty Holy God. As he would come into that, through that veil, into the presence of the Holy of Holies, there the glory would come. I want to close today by telling you what number seven is. Number seven is not the ark, although it's there. Number seven is not the cherubims, although they're there. And number seven is not the blood being sprinkled by the hyssop and the high priest on that ark. I want you to turn to Hebrews, and I'll close with this. Hebrews chapter 10. I'll show you what it is. Chapter 10 and verse 19. <clears throat> it says, having therefore, look at it, chapter 10 verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Look at that word, boldness. Having therefore, look at it, verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter. Number seven 
is what we're after. And number seven is what we're getting is boldness. You know what the anointing is? It is a boldness of the Holy Ghost. You see, when you come to the gate and you meet Jesus and you see him, and then if you go in and you see the altar and you understand the blood, and then God lets you come and he lets you wash in the laver of your hands and your feet, and you begin to highly develop the milk of the word so that it paves your path with butter. And then God lets you move on into the holy place where there's a table of shoe bread, and God says, I'm going to let you be persecuted a little bit to see if you got any root. And then after you endure your time of persecution and you're not flung off, God then lets you come to the lampstand where you get a revelation and you begin to grow deeper and say, oh, my Lord, my God, whew, I never saw this. I never knew you was like that, my God. God will show you who he is before he lets you see who he is. And then as you walk past that, you see, you'll never be able to really worship either friend and praise like you want to until you get revelation of who he is. If you try to think up who God is, your praise is always going to suffer. If you just try to think of the Lord walking here in sandals on the earth, you can only praise him so much because you just have a certain limited revelation. But once you get past that persecution and God lets you get to that golden lampstand where you begin to get revelation of who the Lord really is, then praises just begin to roll out of your mouth almost like you're vomiting them out. Woo! Glory to God! See? And then you put that incense on that golden altar, and then the praises and the worship begins to fill the house, and then he lifts that veil. And as you walk in, here's what you get. The Bible says, let us enter boldly. You know what characterized the early church? Boldness. You know what churches today are lacking? Boldness. Boldness. It shows they're not at the lampstand. It shows they're not at the, at the golden altar. It shows they hadn't washed real good in the labor. They stopped somewhere out in the courtyard, and they're just talking about the blood, saving them. But they never came through the door. There's a journey into the anointing, friend. And once you get there, and once you take the journey, and once you're proven, the one thing you'll get is this. You're going to get boldness like you never dreamed. Yeah. Turn to Acts chapter 4, and I'll close with this one, I promise. Acts chapter 4, and I close. Y'all with me? Yeah. Chapter 4, verse 13. Look at this. Turn to Acts 4, 13. Look at it verse real quick. Now, when they saw the what? Say it. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had what? Been with Jesus. Come on, help me. Say it out. They took knowledge of them that they had what? Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness. Look at verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were all assembled, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with what? Boldness. Boldness comes when the anointing comes. Boldness comes when the glory comes. And let me tell you something else about the glory of God, friend, and about the anointing. And I, I promise you I'll close with this. I promise you. I give you my almost word that I close with this. Now listen, I really am closing with this. Let me tell you something about the anointing. You've got to catch the anointing when it's moving. You can't wait. You remember, Steve's been preaching about the eunuch, you remember, and the Ethiopian. You remember that? And he's talking about how that he ran, Philip. He ran to catch that anointing. He wanted to hear. He was reading that Ethiopian, that unit was reading, and Philip ran. He took advantage. He seized the moment. The Bible said one day, God told David in the Old Testament, he said, when you see the rustling and the moving of the mulberry trees, he said, it's time to move. It's time to go. When that rustling of the mulberry trees begins to take place, you've got to go. The Bible said in the New Testament that when the waters were stirred at the pool, the first one in got their healing. When the anointing is moving, you've got to be bold to break out of ranks and to break out of religion and jump in and obey God right there on the spot. 
I believe that the time is coming where we're going to come to church and we're not going to worry about if a song is being sung or the preacher's preaching or whatever. If God wants to heal and the mulberry trees begin to rustle, we'll stop preaching and lay hands on the sick and believe God to heal the sick. Jesus was up teaching in the, in the house and there were so many people around. They, he looked up and there was stuff coming from the ceiling and they was cutting a hole out up there. And I'm sure one of the ushers started to run up there and get rid of them. Jesus said, wait a minute. The anointing is moving. Let them cut a hole in the roof. I'll heal the roof, bless God. Let them let that man down here and get his healing while the anointing is moving. God, give us boldness to break out of religion that whatever God wants to do, we'll be bold enough to say, God, do it. Yes. I'm not worried about the songs, Lord. I'm not even worried about it if it's in the middle of the offering. I remember one time our preacher was preaching, and I promise I close. I remember one time our pastor was preaching years ago, and I do close with this, honestly. Our pastor was preaching, and it was on a Sunday night, and there was a woman come in with three little girls. And while the pastor was preaching, I'm telling you, folks, this man knew God. This man knew God. When I say, Brother Wessel knew God, I'm not talking to you from a boy eyes of 14 years old. I'm talking to you from a man that knew him for years. He was a man of God. You understand that? You might not know many men of God, but he was a man of God. He was up preaching. This woman came in the back of the church. She had three little girls. And right in the middle of his sermon, he stopped. And he said, oh, my. He said, well, I've been preaching here tonight. He said, Holy Spirit, it's just invaded the service. And he said, he just told me that there was a woman that just walked in back here with three little girls. And he said, ma'am, you're that lady. And he said, you're on the way to Atlanta to take your kids to relatives and you're going into a sanitarium to die. And you have no husband and you're on your way to go into a sanitarium to die. And you're going to take your little girls to a relative's house because you don't intend to come out alive. He said, that's what the Holy Ghost just showed me. He said, you come down here right now, we're, and the Lord's going to heal you. Bow, just like that, he said it. Right in the middle of the sermon. That woman tried to stand up, and she was shaking so under the power of God because she knew that God had to tell the man that. He didn't know her from Adam. And she tried to stand up, and they was putting her down the aisle like this, like, a, like an invalid. She was shaking and couldn't hardly stand up under the power of God. And she walked up and he said, Now, Lord, heal. She hit that floor and she was in that church, my friends, for years under his ministry and never died. <laughs> never took her kids anywhere to leave them. Never took her kids anywhere to leave them. She was healed. God raised her up. Brother, when God begins to move, you better be willing to move with God. I feel the water stirring right now. Everybody stand to your feet. Lift your hands and begin to talk to Jesus. Whoo! Holy Ghost. Come on, worship him. Worship him. Worship him, church. Shando Rebeto Hallelujah. Worship him. Worship there's nothing waiting for you outside, friend. Worship him inside. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord. I'd like for the ushers to come, if you would, the workers, and begin to distribute these emblems for communion. Friends, listen to me. We're going to close this service. Pastor's going to come back, and, and we're going to have communion together. I saw something a few minutes ago that I just marveled at. Now, you may look at your watch and go, my, my, it's so late. You know, that's such a ridiculous thing to even think. That, that's, once again, tradition. 
And you think, but God must be looking in from heaven and a statement like that, my, my, it's late. You're looking at late. So you gave me a few hours. You know, think about that. But I saw something a few minutes ago. The doors opened and about six people walked in and found their seats. That was about 10 minutes ago. And I turned to Mike.